rather than, uh, it, it's always good to sort of review what um, what has been going on, but, but I don't think we need to review absolutely everything. I think to understand um, limit, we really just need to remember um, that there is a difference between being determinate and being something. This is, um, that goes right back to the beginning of the logic again. Uh, so we had <coughs> nothing becoming dialectic, we had the account of Dasein, and then we had the, the account of something another. Now, in some cases, and even people who know the logic very well, like, for example, Whitfield, um, don't always distinguish very clearly between the structure of being determinate and being something. Uh, but I've tried to argue that there is a clear difference there, that to be determinate is to be one side of a difference. And that comes in uh, most clear, or becomes explicit, with the difference between reality and negation, which are two sides of a difference. So each, in that sense, is one-sided. So I suppose that's one way of thinking of it. To be determinate through negation is to be one-sided, to be one side of the difference. To be uh, something is to be what Hegel calls a relation to self, but sealed obviously. And that means not just being a simple negation, but being the negation of negation. But not a one-sided negation of a one-sided negation. Uh, being a negation of the negation is simply in the sense of not being a one-sided negation by virtue of being self-related. So the distinction is between being self-related, which is to be something, and being determinate, which is being this one-sided moment of a difference. Once we've got something, and Hegel goes through the, uh, uh, the logical development of something, we reach the point at which something itself proves to be determinate. And that's when something proves to be a limited something. So the limit is simply the explicit determinacy of something. It's something in the way we uh, understood it, uh, to be a, a self-relating uh, uh, being, to be itself. But something that has its being explicitly in not being the other. And that's not, the not just the description that we give, that is a constitutive moment of something itself. So despite all the complexities that we saw arise with the other, being for self, being for other, and so on, uh, being itself and being for other. Really what's just happened is that being is proved to be determinate, then it's proved not just to be determinate, but to be something, and then it's proved to be determinate as something. And that gets you to the idea of a limit. And it's worth somehow thinking, when you go back over the text, don't just look at the, obviously do look at the details, but try and stand back and see the woods, not just the trees. And see the patterns that, that, uh, that emerge. And when that happens, I know it sounds a bit absurd to say it, but there is a certain simplicity about the way the whole thing uh, unfolds, uh, actually. Anyway, okay, so we have something limited. To be, then, is not just to be something, but it is to be something limited with respect to another. For reasons I went over last time, namely that being something limited and related to something else, basically reduces both sides of that relation to the same. Hegel thus focuses on what it is to be something limited, uh, as it were, by itself, which is the same structure on either side. And what he's interested in is the relationship between the limit and what you might call the affirmative determinate being of the something. And the argument is that something is what it is through a limit, but it's also not its limit. It falls, therefore, this side of its limit, outside the limit. And yet, it is only in and through the limit. So that creates a paradox, that something, this side of the limit, is what it is only in and through the limit, which is its non-being. So Hegel claims, this is on 127, um, it's in gamma uh, in the section on the limit, if you're using the uh, Giovanni. I won't go through the whole of it, but it's once he's gone uh, past this, this, the idea of the double identity again. Um, 
he says, this is three uh, gamma uh, in the section on the uh, uh, limit after the reference to the double identity. He says that something has its determinate being only in the limit. And that since the limit and the determinate being are each at the same time the negative of each other, the something which is only in the limit just as much separates itself from itself and points beyond itself to its non-being, declaring this to be its being and thus passing over into it. So that, what justifies that idea that something passes over from its affirmative being into its limit is the idea that it is both this side of the limit, and in that sense distinct from it, and yet it is what it is only in being limited. And so it has its being in and through the limit, which is its non-being. So the logic of that is that its very being passes over from its affirmative that being into its non-being. And that passing over from being to non-being is just the process of reaching your limit, coming to your non-being, coming to the point at which you stop. So to be finite is just for Hegel to stop, to end. And it's inherent in every something that it ends. And as he puts it um, later when we get to uh, um, the section on finitude, it's not as if this ceasing to be or ending is a possibility such that something could be without ceasing to be. Its very being is its ceasing to be. So, so finite things not only have to be determinate, sorry, something not only has to be determinate with the limit, but it brings itself to that limit, brings itself to its end, and so is finite. And this is important, because Hegel is often thought of, uh, and to a certain extent rightly, obviously, as the philosopher of the infinite, the absolute, the totality. Um, but what comes before that is finitude. And finitude, notice here, is built in logically to what it is to be something. It has nothing to do with time at all. Because the problem with connecting being, uh, being finite with time is you've always got this sort of impossible thought, well, what if something weren't in time? Well, then it wouldn't be finite. Because finitude is the responsibility of time. That's not Hegel's view. There is no option here because what it is to be finite is built into what it is to be something, which is built into what it is to be. To be. So finite attitude ending is irreducible and unavoidable. Um, that doesn't mean to say it's going to happen immediately. Of course, the question of how long it takes is, you know, for, if you're a, a bacterium, um, then it, being finite can take a, an awful long time to work itself out. But the principle is that things uh, end. Um, Okay, just to review again, this is page 129 in the section on finitude. Um, there is a subtle distinction between being limited and being finite, finite, even though being finite follows from being limited. And the distinction is that being limited, strictly speaking, is being limited with respect to another. So you can't be limited by yourself. You can only be limited with respect to another. But being finite is being what he calls negatively self-related. Being finite is bringing oneself to an end. So being finite is not essentially a relation to something else. It's a relation to one's own being, such that one has one's being in one's non-being. The one is derivable from the other. Being finite is derivable from being limited, according to Hegel. But they're not the same. Um, whereas, for example, for Spinoza, they are the same. For Spinoza, being finite just is being limited by something of the same kind. And indeed, for Spinoza, there is no such thing as this sort of being towards death that you would, you could uh, uh, you could talk about. Um, because if, ever, if if a thing was taken on its own, impossibly, it would just be. Its canatus makes it be. It doesn't make it not be. Okay, so that gets. So we're in the section now on finitude. Um, uh, very briefly, <coughs> what. This whole section is about, I'm not going to go all, all over it again, is um, Hegel first notes that 
there is a certain, what he calls, stubbornness, a sort of one-sided stubbornness to finitude, in that finitude is the movement from being to non-being, and that's it. At the beginning of the logic, pure being became nothing, became pure being, became nothing. There was a, uh, like an endless cycle. But finitude is not like that. It is the passage from being to non-being, and that's it. So he says, finitude is the most stubborn category of the understanding. Although, as I said, I think last time, that's a little bit misleading, because it's not just a category of the understanding, and its stubbornness isn't just due to the understanding. Its stubbornness, as it were, is built into it. It is itself this movement only to its end, as Hegel puts it. It is itself the refusal, that's verweigern, to let itself be brought affirmatively to its affirmative. The understanding, though, persists in this, as it were, it takes over that stubbornness that is in um, finitude already. And then Hegel notes, by so doing, the understanding gets itself into a paradox, into a mess. Because by insisting that finitude is only finitude, that's all it is, it renders finitude imperishable and absolute. It turns it into something eternal. And this is always going to be a problem, from Hegel's point of view, for any philosophy that insists that all there is is the finite. Because in so doing, finitude itself is made absolute, so the position is, is, is contradictory. That, however, is not how Hegel gets to infinity. Okay, this is not that idea is sort of extraneous to the, the logical development. That's just a remark, an observation that Hegel's making about the understanding. Indeed, Hegel distinguishes between two different cases. So this is in, uh, again, the immediacy of finitude, this is alpha, second main paragraph, uh, uh, about five or six lines in uh, a sentence that actually Miller um, uh, mistranslates. And the sentence goes like this. But the point is, whether in thinking of the finite, one <coughs> holds fast to the being of the finite, and the transitoriness continues to be. I think that Di Giovanni is fine on this. There's no letting going on. So the one option, which is the option chosen by the understanding, is that one holds fast to the being of the finite, and the transitoriness continues to be. Or which will be, as it were, the speculative rational point of view, whether the transitoriness and the ceasing to be cease to be. So it's going to be that idea, which we don't yet understand, because we don't yet know what the transition to infinity is going to be. But we do know that it's going to come from letting ceasing to be cease to be, letting the finite be finite. And that really, it seems to me, is the heart of the whole issue, which is why I find this such a powerful account. Hegel's claim is, if you cling on to the finite, you'll lose it. You won't, you can't think the finite properly if you think the finite as purely finite. Because you absolutize it. The only way to think the finite properly is to think the finite, it's ceasing to be, as itself ceasing to be. And thereby becoming infinity. So you're going to get infinity either way. The question is, do you get it by letting the finite, thinking the finite properly, and let it be what it is, which is the very ceasing to be of its own ceasing to be? The ending of its ending. Or do you hold on to it? This is really very much parallel to what we saw earlier with the move from becoming to determinate being. The thought there as well is, although he doesn't put it in quite these terms, that, that if you cling on to the idea of becoming, you're not really thinking becoming properly. The only way to think becoming properly is to think it's becoming determinate being. And I suppose this is the dialectical moment in Hegel. You either find it exhilarating, as I have done for 40 odd years, or you hate it. Or you're oh, you're indifferent to it. Um, but, um, but you'll either dislike it, it's wrong, or you'll find it really uh, exciting. Or I suppose if you're someone like Derrida, you'll be excited by it, but somehow be a little bit suspicious and not want to be drawn in. And so you'll spend you know, your lifetime trying not to be brought into it. You think, so why? What's the point? Um, 
Okay, so that I think is really, really crucial. This is what I, I'm just going to bang onto it one more time. The claim Hegel's making, and the claim you've got to think about, is is this right? Is it right to claim that if you think finitude as purely finitude, you're not thinking it? You can only think it properly when you think it the ceasing to be that it is in its very ceasing to be. And that will require thinking it uh, as a transition to uh, infinity. That's the claim he's made. Right, so having gone through all of that, he now looks at the structure, the internal structure of uh, the finite, which is set out in this section on the limitation of the ought. Um, it's really interesting, it's quite difficult, um, and I think, if it's all right with you, I'm going to give you the highlights rather than going through it in detail, um, and then hopefully you can go back and look at it. Um, so, obviously, the finite is the passage from being into non-being. So there is an aspect of the finite that is. And that's what Hegel's looking at here. But he's going to argue that even this aspect of the finite, insofar as it is, that's a, that's a, before it's ended, if we put it that way, ultimately involves double negation. OK, so the idea of a limitation is the idea of an imminent internal limit. So there's a distinction that Hegel draws between a limit, which is a grenze, a boundary. The, uh, the German border agency is the Bundesgrenzschutz, the federal protective protection of the border. So that's grenze. But then the limitation is a schranke. A limitation, then, is an imminent limit. It's, an imminent, it's a limit that belongs to and is constitutive of being finite. Remember, a limit is respect with respect to another. So you have a grenze in relation to something else. But you have a schranke. We have schranke all by ourselves. We don't need anything else to have a schranke. The schranke is built into who we are. It's our imminent limitation. And the reason why Hegel moves from the idea of Grenze to, Sch to Schranke is because he's moving from the idea of a limited thing with respect to something else to a finite thing which brings itself to its own limit, which has its own limit within it. And so a Schranke is just one's own limit, a limitation. Uh, I'm not sure, I can't remember, I've worked through the, um, the Di Giovanni, whether Di Giovanni is completely... Uh, consistent on this. I think he uses restriction. Mm, yeah, well, maybe. The problem with, for me, the problem with restriction is that it still has that echo that something else is doing the restricting. And it's very important here that that's not happening. Nothing else is doing the restricting. If you don't have that, that thought, then don't worry about it. If restriction for you is quite obviously something that's purely imminent, well then fine, then leave the translation. But if restriction in any way brings to mind the idea of being sort of constricted by something else, then, then get rid of it and put in limitation instead. Okay, so now the point here is that a limitation is imminent in the something. And so it is constitutive of what something is. We're no longer, as we are with the limit, able to distinguish between what something is and its limit. Something is this side of its limit, but it's not this side of its limitation, because the limitation is inherent in it. It's constitutive of it. It is its limitation. So this raises the obvious question. Well, then what is it a limitation on? If the thing is its limitation, what is the limitation a limitation on? Because the limitation is still a version of the limit, it's still a non-being, and still so must negate something. Well, Hegel argues that it cannot be a limitation on the full being of the thing, because the full being of the thing is itself constituted by the limitation. So the limitation can only be a limitation on the thing's being insofar as that being falls short of being, as it were, the full being of the thing. And the name he gives to that being 
is the zollen, the ought, the should. I generally like the should better because the ought immediately gets me worried about moral issues, whereas the should perhaps uh, avoids that. And, and this is not a moral uh, zollen. It's an ontological zollen. So, uh, if we look at uh, 131, um, the limitation and the ought, I think it's 103 maybe, is it? In, uh, in the, uh, actually, sorry, 132, I apologize. 132, uh, it's in the second full paragraph under beta, the limitation and the ought. It's about halfway through that paragraph. I think it'll be 103 or 104 in the Di Giovanni. Hegel writes the following, something's own limit, thus posited by it as a negative, which is at the same time essential, is not merely limit as such, can serve a limitation, Schranke. But what is posited as negated is not limitation alone, the negation is two-edged, since what is posited by it as negated is the limit, and this in general is what is common to both something and the other, and is also a determinant of the in itself, of the determinant determination as such. So the idea there is because limitation is a version of limit, and a limit sort of disjoins but also conjoins two moments and makes each side a non-being, then the limitation, which is itself in relation to the being of the thing, turns that being into itself a kind of non-being, a being that's a kind of non-being, a being that isn't full being. And the name he gives to that is the, the, the zola, the should. The in itself, therefore, as the negative relation to its limit, to itself, as limitation, is the ought. So, something finite has a limitation, but the limitation is a limitation on what it should be. It's not just a limitation on what it is, because it's constitutive of what it is. <coughs> so, you know, you take This bag, I mean, friend, fall into bits. I mean, this this bag, it's 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 I don't know, it's 20, 25 years old. Okay, just about fallen together. It's obviously got a certain limitation to it, and zips don't do up. You know, the handles fall into bits. But the limitation is considered of what it is. So what's that limitation? A limitation on, if not what the bag itself as a bag should be. But of course the bag isn't what it should be, except it's clear that it should be a bag whose zips will do up. But because of the limitation that makes it the bag that it is, it therefore isn't what it should be. And Hegel's thought is that that relationship between limitation and should is constitutive of any finite thing. Every finite thing is in some way limited by what it is with respect to what it should be. And its being is the relationship between those two. That should is what elsewhere gets cashed out later in the logic as the concept of the thing. So when Hegel talks later of finite things, in finite things their concept and their you know, Daseins were falling apart. This is the origins of that of that idea. Note that the should is not an external standard. A thing with a limitation is not falling short of what something else requires it to be, but it falls short of what it is itself intrinsically. But only intrinsically. Because, of course, what it really is, is marked by its limitation. Similarly, this ought is not a moral or it's, it's an ontological should. So what Hegel's deriving here is the very idea that there is a should built into being. You know, don't confuse the ought and the is. Well, you can't really do that because the ought is built into the is. The ought as that which should be but isn't fully, as that which is less than being marked by a certain non-being, is inherent to being a finite thing. Okay. 
Okay, but then Hegel goes on to note that the should, or rather, if I put it like this, only ought he to be, only, you can't make a, 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 a gerund out of should, okay? but never mind, um, is itself a limitation. The fact that a finite thing only should be what it is, but is prevented from being that by its limitation, is itself a limitation. So limitation falls on both sides. It has the limitation, <coughs> it is, which is a limitation on what it should be, but it's only shoulding to be, as it were, is itself a limitation. So, I'm jumping ahead now um, to... Uh, a paragraph that begins what ought to be is and at the same time is not. Um, so this is uh, one, two, three, <coughs> like four paragraphs down from the one I just looked at. What ought to be is and at the same time is not. If it were, we could not say that it ought merely to be. Sort of obvious. The ought has therefore essentially a limitation. This limitation is not alien to it. So not only is the limitation a limitation on what the thing should be, but it's merely is the fact that its being is reduced to a mere should is itself a limitation. So the thing is actually a relation between a limitation and a limitation, a negative and a negative. It is its being consists in not being the not being that it is, and it has no purely affirmative being. So this, remember, is what it is to be finite before it's ended. So being finite is itself the passage from being into non-being, but even as being, being finite is as such the relationship between a negative and a negative. The limitation is a negation on what? The should, which is itself the oughting not to be limited. So the limitation is a limit on the negation of the limitation. It's just a play of, of, uh, of, of negatives. So here again we had, have the idea that something involves negativity. So go back to the very idea of something at all. What distinguishes something from being determinate is that being determinate is being a simple negation. Being something is not just being that, being self-relating. But in being self-relating, and so not just being negative, something is the negation of the negation, negativity. So you've got simple negation, and you've got double negation, negativity, which is constitutive of being something. But it's constitutive of being something by virtue of having, as it were, an affirmative form. Negativity there constitutes affirmative being. But when we get to the finite, the thing is negatively self-related in a more negative way. First, it brings itself to its own end. It negates itself by ending. But now we also see that it's internally the relationship between a negative and a negative. A limitation and an oughting not to be limited. You say, well, what's positive? Well, nothing's positive there apart from the relation of those two. So again, if you take the big picture, what it is to be finite just renders explicit what it is to be something. They're not essentially different categories. To be finite is to be something when the negativity in something has been rendered fully explicit. Now, of course, if you didn't think that negativity belongs to being something in the first place, this is not going to make any sense. So if you're Parmenides, or if you're Spinoza, this is not going to make any sense. But if Hegel's right that to be something in the first place is constituted by negativity, then this makes a lot of sense. One point to raise here, by the way, this looks as if the finite thing sort of evaporates altogether and just sort of disappears. But remember that Hegel You've got to think of Hegel's logic as providing, if this is not going to be a really stupid sort of analogy, a sort of set of CAT scans in a way. It sort of slices through. So 
you're thinking, what is it to be? What is it to be determinate? What is it to be something? What is it to be limited? What is it to be finite? But what you mustn't forget when you're thinking what it is to be finite is that the finite thing is still something with an intrinsic being and another relatedness and a determination and a constitution. So the finite being has a positive being, but not insofar as it's finite. Or rather, you've got to think of its finite being as incorporating not just its finitude, but the other moments too. So in fact, a finite thing as fully understood doesn't just evaporate into nothingness. Insofar as it's finite, it has no affirmative being outside of that relation of the negative to the negative. But insofar as it's finite, it is also something with an intrinsic being and so on. So you've got to remember that as you're getting these slices, you've also got to put them together to get a picture of what's going on. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about the, um, uh, the limitation of the ought. Um, there is, in the remark, then Hegel obviously makes reference here to, to Kant and, 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 uh, and Fichte. And, of course, the fact that the being finite involves this should allows Hegel then to say later that any moral theory that stops short at the should is a finite moral theory. But the truth of the finite is not the finite. So the truth of morality is not just the ought, the should. If you think morality is just about saying what you ought to do, then for Hegel, you don't understand morality. As we know in the philosophy of right, morality must become ethical life, in which the moral is a moment, but um, which is not exhausted by it. So there is, there are implications here for Hegel's theory of, 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 of normativity, if you like. Although this is not yet explicitly a, a normative should. So we can come back and discuss this uh, later if you want to, but I want to sort of press on a bit while we've got some momentum going. Okay, so now what Hegel looks at in Gamma is the process through which the finite in ending proves to be infinite unending being. Now I wrote in the opening of Hegel's logic, and I still think this is true, that by my calculation, there are five different conceptions of infinity in, in Hegel's logic of quality. And of course, you've then also got to add in the notions of infinity involved in quantitative infinity, and there's a notion of infinity involved in measure as well. So you're getting, so there isn't just Hegel's conception of the infinite. There are lots of them. Um, but they are related, and I guess they do fall into two basic uh, types that we, we see already uh, here. So, what Hegel's now examining is what happens when something ends. It ceases to be, but in ceasing to be, he claims, it does not pass into mere nothing. Because we lost nothing right at the beginning of the logic. There is no more pure nothing that's gone. So the finite, in ceasing to be, passes into a negative that is not just negative. But as such, it must therefore be the negative of the negative, and so just be the finite once again. So the finite, in ending, ends. It seriously ends. It doesn't come back again. It's gone. In that finitude for Hegel is irreversible. And, just to throw in a provocation, <coughs> it's for that reason that he thinks the true religion is Christianity. Which would be gobbledygook to someone like Nietzsche. But that, it's the irreversibility of finitude and death that Hegel uh, sees at the uh, core of Christianity. Again, we can talk about that later. But anyway, leave that to one side. The finite ends, and in ending, it doesn't just become nothing, but it becomes the negative of an entity, which is itself, as he puts it, the very determination of the finite. In that sense, then, the finite in ceasing to be doesn't just cease to be, but becomes another finite. Okay, let me read you the bits that I think are relevant to all of this. So, gamma, the transition from the finite to the infinite. We can skip the, the first few lines, because that's going back over... 
thought and limitation. And pick it up where he says, the finite is thus inwardly self-contradictory. It sublates itself, is alpha. Uh, sorry, it sublates itself, ceases to be. But this, its result, the negative as such, is alpha, its very determination, its very bushdimon. For it is the negative of the negative. Thus, in ceasing to be, the finite has not ceased to be. It has become, in the first instance, only another finite, which, however, is equally as ceasing to be as transition into another finite, and so on to infinity. Ins und endlicher, ad infinitum. One remark that you could relate to this, uh, which is um, which is useful to anyway, if you look back in uh, the section alpha, the immediacy of the finite, and uh, it's page 131 at the top, and I think it's page 102 at the bottom in the Di Giovanni. It's where it's anyway. It's at the end of the penultimate paragraph, and he says, if, however, the finite is not to pass away in the affirmative, but its end is to be grasped as nothing, then we should be back again at that first abstract nothing, which itself has long since passed away. And just That's where Hegel says explicitly that nothing has gone. So in ending, we can't just have nothing. We have a negative that's not just a negative. Or as he puts it, the negative of the negative. But that just is the bestimmung of being finite itself. So the finite in ending gives rise to an endless sequence of finites. So this gives us our first infinity, which is just endless finitude. So the first infinity isn't anything qualitatively different from finitude. It's just finitude over and over again. So we could sort of present it like this. It's just the finite giving rise to the finite, and so on and so on. But it is unending. Das unendliche, and so in that sense, not itself, finite. And this is an infinity generated by the very ending of the finite. This is not at odds with the finite. This is what happens when things end. They give rise to other things. That end. So you can see here the subtle undermining of the distinction, or the pure distinction, between finitude and change. Earlier, we get change where something becomes other and other than itself and other than itself. And finitude is very different from that. Finitude is not just becoming other than yourself and retaining an identity. It's ending. But here, one can see that finitude as ending is itself the process whereby the finite changes into another finite. And so this, if you like, is a sort of logical justification for sort of Leibniz's view, I guess, that there is a certain sort of, um, you know, the, 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 when, when Abraham sacrifices the ram, the ram itself becomes the ashes. The ashes just are what the ram in its finitude was always destined to be. It's another finite that is just what arises through the ending of the previous one. This does not mean that the first one doesn't end. The first one does end. Indeed, it's only in ending that this infinity can come to be, and that's absolutely crucial. For Hegel, it's only in the ending of the finite that there can be infinity. You can't get true infinity by holding on to the finite. That's what the understanding does. But for Hegel, you only get to infinity insofar as the finite ends. Okay, so that's number one. That's the first um, infinity. But then he immediately goes on in beta to highlight a different sense in which there is infinity in this process. And it really is just a different aspect of this process. We're not looking at something else. We just still have this process whereby the finite gives rise to another finite. So what he says is, under beta, the following. But closer examination, closer consideration, sorry, of this result shows that the finite in its ceasing to be 
in this negation of itself, has attained its being in itself, is united with itself. So that's to say, not just that the finite in ending becomes another finite, but the finite in ending comes to be what it itself is intrinsically. After all, what is the finite, if not the passage from being into its own non-being? So the finite in ending just come, becomes to be what it, as if you like, is always born to be. And so in that sense, it doesn't end insofar as its very being continues in the form of its non-being. So the other finite is just like a continuation of the first. So it's not only that the ram necessarily gives way to the ashes, but the ashes just are what the ram intrinsically is. We're all born to be dust. And the dust is something other than we are, but it's also what we are intrinsically. That is a somewhat different sense of unending being. That is not unending being as if like a sequence, an endless sequence but unending being as a genuine continuing of being. So if you can imagine, this is understood as an endless sequence. You've got finite one, you've got finite two, you've got finite three, etc. But if you then think that each of these are just like further forms of that first finite, then you have a, a continuity of unending being being that doesn't end. Now this idea of something uniting with itself, we've already seen in the move, for example, to something. People have asked about it. What does Hegel mean by this idea of a sort of self-relating? The thought is that as the finite ends and gives way to another finite, it actually relates to itself and continues to be in another form. And it's in that relating to itself, continuing to be itself, that we get a different sense of infinity, unendlich sein. And maybe it's worth thinking here not of, don't nominalize it, don't think of the infinite. Think of infinity as a way of being, as a kind of being. There's being that is finite that ends, and there's being that doesn't end. And the point Hegel's making here is that in the very process whereby finite things end, there is and must be being that doesn't end. And that's because being finite and ending isn't just becoming something else, but it's coming to be intrinsically what the finite itself is. It's attaining its being in itself, as he puts it. In this negation of itself, the finite has attained its being in itself, its intrinsic being. It has come to be what it intrinsically is, which is non-being. So there are then two senses of infinity. There is infinity in the sense of endless finitude. And there is infinity in the sense of continuity of a coming to remain, which is one of Hegel's sort of favorite ideas. That you can only come to remain. You can't sort of remain at the start. You can't, at the start, be something remain. You can only remain as something else disappears. So you can only come to remain. And that's what's happening uh, here. <coughs> Just so you know where we're going, uh, these two senses prefigure what's going to be the progress to infinity and ultimately the true infinite. So the progress to infinity will be another version of endless finitude, and true infinity will be another version of this continuing being. But, but the, neither of the two later ones are quite the same as what we've got here. So don't just conflate the, the two together. That is Hegel's transition 
from finitude to infinity. And you can see, whatever you think about it, is that for Hegel, infinity arises in the ending of finite things. And it's got to be that way around. Logically, ending comes first. And infinity is that being that doesn't end in the ending of things. So a number of things we note from this. That infinity is not separable from the ending of things. It's that, it's what we encounter, what there is in the ending of things. And it takes at least these two different forms. Okay, all right, so we move to the section on infinity. Um, I won't look at the, uh, the opening bit uh, where, where he does actually already anticipate uh, the distinction between the spurious or the bad infinite and, and the infinite reason, because we'll come to that in a minute. Um, but we'll begin by just looking at what he says about the, uh, the infinite in general. Um, and I'm hoping what he describes here happens to you when you, when you read this. Um, he says, the infinite is the negation of the negation, affirmation, being, which has restored itself out of limitedness. The infinite is, and more intensely so, than the first immediate being. It is the true being. The elevation above limitation, except it's not really above, is it? This is the bit. At the name of the infinite, the heart and the mind light up. I'm just looking at this. Yeah. Uh, for in the infinite, the spirit is not really abstractly present to itself, but rises to its own self, to the light of its thinking, of its universality, of its freedom. Okay, well, despite all of that, uh, that sort of rhetorical bit, it's the, it's the logic that we're interested in. What he now then goes on to do is, although it's not obvious that this is what's going on, it seems to me, is contrast <coughs> the conception of infinity that he's uh, <coughs> uh, uh, just derived with what we find in Kant. Um, and the, um, the important thing is that infinity, as Hegel conceives it, arises through nothing other than the work of the finite, if we can put it that, like that. So if you look in the next paragraph, um, second sentence, it is the very nature of the finite to transcend itself, to negate its negation, and to become infinite. Thus, the infinite does not stand as something finished and complete or superior, uh, above or superior to the finite, as if the finite had an enduring being apart from and subordinate to the infinite. And this is the reference to Kant, I think. Neither do we only, as subjective reason, pass beyond the infinite to the infinite, as when we say that the finite is the notion of reason, and through reason we rise superior to temporal things though we let this happen without prejudice to the finite, which is no way affected by this exaltation. But the finite itself, in being raised into the infinite, is in no sense acted upon by an alien force. On the contrary, it is its nature to be related to itself as limitation uh, and to transcend the same. It is not in the sublating of finitude in general that infinity in general comes to be. The truth is rather that the finite is only this, through its own nature to become itself the infinite. So it seems to me we've got, that's the contrast he's drawing. Hegel's argument is that the finite through its own nature comes uh, to be infinite being. And this is contrasted with a view in which we only, as subjective reason, pass uh, beyond the finite. So, um, I'm... I don't know whether you're all familiar with the can. Let's assume for a minute that you aren't, and apologies if you are. If you are, then this will be fine. Uh, but you will, you'll know that for can, objects of experience require both intuition and understanding. And understanding, uh, which is the source of the categories, also uh, formulates judgments. So our experience of objects in the world, which is a result of understanding and intuition working together. Um, also involves judgment. So you could say that we sort of for Kant, long time before Wittgenstein, we can't experience objects without, in some sense, seeing them as, without implicitly judging them to be such and so. So then we have to ask, well, what work does reason do? Well, what reason does is take the judgment. So if we, let's say, we have a, a judgment uh, of the understanding of understanding. And what reason does is treat that as a, as a, a like a conclusion of a syllogism. 
So if we regard this as the conclusion, then obviously we need, going backwards, we need the sort of minor premise, and then we need the major premise. So reason in its simplest form derives the judgments of understanding from previous premises, which are obviously other further uh, judgments. So reason is the activity of syllogizing, whereas understanding is the activity of judging. But Kant thinks that there is an intrinsic telos, if you like, sort of backward-looking telos, if you put it that way, to reason, in the reason inevitably through its own activity points towards what is going to be the ultimate major premise, sort of absolute premise, infinite premise, if you want. And Kant calls that ultimate major premise uh, an idea. So the idea of reason is the idea basically of the unconditioned. And it takes three forms. You can have the idea of uh, soul, the idea of the totality of the things in the world, and the idea of God, which is sort of the ultimate condition of the totality of things as such. Now, I don't want to go into all of that, but just so you can see that what gets, what, what produces the idea of the unconditioned for Kant is the work of reason. And I think this is what Hegel's got in mind here when he's saying, Neither do we only, as subject of reason, pass beyond the finite and the infinite. You know that Hegel thinks that Kant's reason is subjective, not in the sense that it's individual to individual people, but that it is our activity. Whereas what Hegel's trying to argue is that reason is in things. Reason is inherent in being itself. And it's inherent in us insofar as it's inherent in being. But for Kant, reason is our activity, because Kant is still, in that sense, a, uh, a late, uh, you know, a, a sort of in that tradition, going from Descartes through Locke, of being focused ultimately on what, what we do, what our thinking does. So that's Kant's version that we reason is the activity of moving backwards through a system of syllogisms to reach the unconditioned, the absolute, the infinite, which is ultimately a product of reason, and as such can only ever be an idea that guides our experience, but, but doesn't have any constitutive role in it. <coughs> For Hegel, by contrast, um, the finite passes in and of itself uh, into uh, the infinite. Oh, by the way, the other thing that's uh, obvious about this is that this process of moving back from judgment to the idea doesn't affect the judgments. It leaves the judgments, which for Hegel is sort of the realm of the finite, finite understanding, unaffected. And that's again what Hegel's got in mind here, that the Kantian idea doesn't, in moving back to the infinite, the status of the finite isn't really affected by that. Whereas, of course, for Hegel, that's, that's not the case. Okay, that's one thought he's got up uh, here. The other thought he brings in at the very end of this paragraph is surprising. It's a bit of a shock when you get there. Um, he says, thus the finite has vanished in the infinite, and what is, is only the infinite. This is not derived, well, in a sense, I suppose it is sort of derived from, from what comes but it, before, but it, it really is a logical consequence of what he's been talking about in Gamma earlier in the, in the transition. And what that expresses <coughs> is that the finite, in its process of ending, proves not just to be that, but to be unending being. See beta under section gamma. And so the finite proves to be its opposite. It proves to be a way of being that is qualitatively not that of finitude. That's what he means here. But don't worry, the finite's going to pop right back up again in a second. But for this moment, the idea is that the finite in ending proves not just to be the process of ending, but to be the process of unending being. And as unending being, finitude is vanished. 
So there's already a bit of a paradox going on here. That finitude itself proves to be unending being in which there's no, or as which there's no finitude. But, let me say a little bit more so that we, uh, I, I'm going to do about another sort of five minutes, that's right, and then we will have a break um, because it's important to sort of not to get stuck there. But, Hegel thinks immediately that the finite is brought back into life, as it were, by the infinite, by the <coughs> fact that the infinite is the negation of the finite. So, the very idea that finitude vanishes is negated in the finite, because the infinite is das unendliche, in finite, also turns the infinite into the negation of the finite, and as such, then, turns it, Hegel says, into something other than the finite, and so brings the finite back again as something other than it. This is what he's getting at under B uh, in the first uh, few lines. The infinite is, in this immediacy, it is at the same time the negation of another of the finite, as thus in the form of simple being, and at the same time as the non-being of another, it has fallen back into the category of something as a determinate being in general. <coughs> so why does the infinite prove to be something other than the finite? Well, because the infinite is the negation of the finite. It's the negation of the finite, in one sense, insofar as it is that where the finite no longer is finite. But it's also the negation of the finite in not being the finite, and that moment of negation, as we saw earlier, constitutes determinate being, which itself proves to be something. So the infinite, through its own logic, must be something other than the finite. Exactly what, a few minutes ago, I said wasn't the case. When we first see infinity arise, it arises as A, endless finitude, and B, the continuing unending being in the ending of finite things. So it's not something other than the finite, because it's the continuity in the ending of the finite. Yet as such, as unending being, it's unending being, not finite being. So finitude vanishes. But it's also unending being, the negation of being that ends. And as the negation, it's something, if you follow the earlier logic. To be a simple negation of something must itself involve being something. So through the logic of infinity, Hegel thinks, we get a third conception of infinity arising. Namely, the infinite as something other than the finite. I'm not going to go through all of this because I think it's time for a break. But, but, but that infinite understood as something other than the finite is the bad infinite, effectively. So the third form of infinity that Hegel derives is that of the bad infinite, the spurious infinite. The infinite that isn't really infinite because it's defined in terms of finitude as something other than the finite. Okay, let's have a short break, and then I want to continue on with a bit more of this, and then we'll stop and have a, uh, a discussion.